I have a feeling you have more than one oil in your own kitchen. Would you would you tell us about what the you know, kinds of oils you work with, uh, the styles of oils you have in your kitchen and why you chose them? Okay. So what kind of oils do I have in my kitchen? Uh, it's hard for me to give anybody advice about that because, um, because I have two oils in my kitchen. I am very privileged to have my own oil from my own family farm in Tuscany. And so... I have two oils. I have this year's harvest and I have last year's harvest. And like most cooks and chefs around the Mediterranean, I tend to use last year's harvest. And now we're talking about the 2020, fall of 2020 harvest. Um, that oil is kind of an all-purpose cooking oil. And the 2021 harvest, which is the most recent harvest, is the one that I use for garnishing, for raw preparations, for salads. Um, anytime I want to impress somebody with my fresh olive oil, I drag that out. So that's uh, that's a, that really is the way most uh, most chefs, I think, certainly Mediterranean chefs uh, react that way to their olive oil. And I would guess that probably 90 percent of the cooking that I do, including baking, is done with olive oil. I occasionally add a little butter for flavor, but that's basically it's an all olive oil uh, uh, cuisine. So. What should a responsible chef have in her kitchen then? Um, I think, of course, she will want an all-purpose cooking oil, extra virgin, of course, because that's the only oil, the only olive oil that's worth talking about. And uh, all-purpose cooking oil, you're not going to use an estate bottled, hand-harvested, beautifully labeled, uh, expensive oil for that any more than you're going to use a Chateau Lafitte Rothschild to make Boeuf Bourguignon. That's just out of the question. But there are loads of responsibly made, well-made, good extra virgin oils from California and Greece in particular, I think of that are that are appropriately priced for that kind of all purpose use. And that's what you should be seeking out, I think. Um, and it's, that's especially true if you have a vegetable forward kitchen, because I think vegetables really need the boost of a fat. Vegetables don't have any fat by their nature. I mean, some have a little bit of fat, but basically it's a pretty fat-free diet if it's vegetarian entirely. And, and we need that fat. We need that fat in order to be able to metabolize the good things that are in the vegetables. So a vegetable forward kitchen, a kitchen that, that, that really is pushing vegetables really needs to have a lot of extra virgin olive oil on hand. And on top of that, um, I think you would have the all-purpose oil. You would have the really good oil that you use for your salads and raw ingredients. And on top of that, you might seek out some specialty oils. I don't mean a lot of them. I don't, I don't like to go into a chef's kitchen and see five or six different bottles of olive oil that have been a third used and you don't know when the, they were open and there's the other two thirds in this hot kitchen and it really distresses me. But one or two specialty oils and you really, you push them to your customers. You say, uh, you know, something like, um, oh, we've got uh, Farmer Frank's um, heritage tomatoes in tonight and we're slicing them and serving them with this delicious pequal oil that our chef tasted in a tiny village in Andalusia last fall and brought home three precious bottles. And you play it up that way. You really market it. And that's the way you get the customers adjusted to, uh, to the idea of extra virgin olive oil, too. I hope that answers your question. I tend to go on at the mouth about this, but I'm really very convinced that um, uh, that this is uh, this is a really important point. And you know, as far as those specialty oils are concerned, the chef doesn't have to make a special trip to a little village in Andalusia to get them. There are purveyors on the market who are who are selling specialty oils. What I would steer people away from are places like um, that uh, that chefs tend to have to use a lot, like Cisco and Whole Foods and things like that. These are mass marketers, basically, and they don't understand olive oil, and there's no reason why they should. But for that reason, we who do understand olive oil don't want to buy for them. We buy from, from specialty purveyors of high-end oils who stand behind the oils they're selling. So that's an important point, too. If we think about extra virgin olive oil on a spectrum of flavors, from you know mild or delicate to very robust, can you talk a little bit about when you would use which style 
uh, when do you use the milder oils, the medium fruity oils, and the really piquant uh, bitter oils? That's a really hard question to answer. It really depends on the chef's own personal taste. And I think encouraging her to play around with oils is really important in her kitchen with her staff. And I don't mean just her kitchen staff, also with her weight staff. Play around with those oils, taste them with different things. You know, I uh, I always remember Bill Brewa, the late Bill Brewa, who's a wonderful uh, teacher in the teaching kitchen at the CIA. And he was very interested in olive oil because the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, had a whole raft of olive trees and nobody was quite sure what to do with these olives. This is going back a number of years. Uh, that wouldn't be the case today. Well, Bill insisted on harvesting them and making oil from them. And it was very good oil because it was fresh. And he devised a wonderful system, a tasting panel, where he would put out a tray of little bits of food. Like I remember there would be um, fresh uh, chopped tomatoes. There would be a little piece of um, rare roast beef. There would be some lettuce. There would be some spicy greens, cooked greens, and a few other things in there, some bread as well. And then he would have a panel of five different olive oils. And you would taste the each of these little ingredients with each one of the five olive oils and see what what happens to the olive oil and what happens to the ingredient when it's tasted with five different olive oils? Then they might be from five different countries. They might all be from the same country, but five different varieties. And to me, I can't tell a chef because I don't know her palate. I can't tell a chef, you should use this with that. Um, it's her job or his job to figure that out. But I would encourage her to get out there in the kitchen and do this work, just as you don't send out a wine list without tasting every single bottle that's on that list and, and having your staff test it so that, so that your staff can, can market it to the customers, first of all, so that your kitchen staff understands what they're working with. And so that you too have a sense of the, um, the overall ensemble of your menu, because it, a menu is not just individual dishes. It's an ensemble of things. It's a, uh, it's kind of like it has its own environment, its own ecology going on. And it's up to you as the chef to understand that. So that would be, uh, that would be my, uh, my criteria. And the other thing that I would emphasize to any chef, the most important quality in an olive oil is freshness. And that I cannot stress how important that is. You know, um, it's, uh, it's not like wine. Wine gets better good wine gets better as it ages. Olive oil doesn't get better as it ages. The International Olive Council puts an age limit on it of two years. And that doesn't mean that at the end of the two years, the olive oil goes bad and it's going to make you sick, like, you know, a rotten orange or a spoiled piece of fish or something. It's still okay. It's okay to use, but it's not top quality and you shouldn't ever be paying top dollar for olive oil that, is, um, that isn't fresh. And I think that's another point that has to be made there in, in talking about freshness, and that is this. You want to look at the harvest date. You don't want to look at the use-by date. And there's a very good reason for that. The use-by date is two years from the date of bottling. Now, that olive oil may have been harvested, let's say, in 2018 and kept in uh, cool um, stainless steel containers for 18 months, 20 months maybe, and then it's bottled. And then the use-by date gets stamped on it. So you, the customer, come along and you may very well be buying oil that's three or almost four years old and you're paying top dollar for it. And that's something that I object to violently. And I warn chefs and, and all consumers against that. Look for the harvest date, not for the use by date. And if the harvest date isn't on there, and it very isn't often on there in these commodity oils, then it's not a fine oil to be used um, in, in the finest parts of your menu. Somebody was telling me recently about going to a restaurant where they wheeled an olive oil cart to the to the table uh, and you and asked you, you know, which oil would you like on your on this dish? There was a choice of oils, 
Can you imagine um, this hap- going on in uh, restaurants more in the future? Is this something you would like like to see more? You know, as much attention paid to the oils as, as chefs paid to the wine lids. I think that's great. I think it's wonderful. As long as the person who's doing the pouring really knows what he or she is talking about. Because, uh, you know, I I go to, there are several shops that I go to, and I think of one in particular, I'm going to mention the name, even though I'm not supposed to, and that's Market Hall Foods in Oakland, where they usually have a raft of olive oils out for people to taste. And I know, because I know the people who run the shop, that at the end of the day, when those oils are, they've been exposed to light and exposed to heat, the two enemies of olive oil, they are whisked away to the kitchen and used for cooking. They are not left out for another day of tasting. And that's the most important thing to understand is that how those olive oils in their bottles are kept, how long that bottle has been open, where it is put when the waiter trundles the cart back to the kitchen, all of that is super important. But if you can guarantee, and if you have a garde manger or whoever, maybe you have an olive oil sommelier in your kitchen who watches over that sort of thing, and she should be ensuring that those olive oils are kept cool Cool, not refrigerated, but cool and dark in between the times they're brought out and that the person the person who's pouring them really has to have tasted them with the dish that she's recommending them for. That to me is super important. I think it's an interesting idea, but it's an expensive idea. It's something for a very high end restaurant to do. Uh, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people have trouble with the really bitter oils, the ones made from with, um, with the what? bitter oils, oils that are oh, right. high yeah. in bitter. Yeah. Uh, mm. how, how would you uh, suggest bringing people along on that journey so that they can appreciate these more bitter oils? How to get people to understand that bitter oils are good oils is a real problem. And I go back to a, a, a poll that was done by UC Davis, University of California at Davis, to, by their olive section several years ago. And they discovered polling people that the accepted taste in uh, the United States, or at least in California, was for rancid oil. And this really startled them because rancid oil is really bad oil and it's not something you should have in your kitchen but it's like kids who grow up having nothing but frozen orange juice and they taste freshly squeezed orange juice and they don't like it how do you get people to accept bitter flavors the other thing i remember is as a kid i loved the smell of freshly roasted coffee and my mother would come home on saturdays from doing her shop and she'd take the the coffee out of the shopping bag and that aroma would flood through the kitchen and i loved it and then probably about 5 years later i had my first taste of real coffee and i could not understand it it was so bitter and so horrible and it probably took me a year and a half But now I drink nothing but bitter coffee. I never put sugar in it. I never put milk in it. And I love it. And I think it's a question of, uh, it it really is a question of sophistication more than anything else. And sophistication in a good sense. Sophisticating your taste. Understanding that there are many, many different flavors. And that not all flavors are acceptable in all situations either. But that bitter flavor is a highly desired flavor by olive oil connoisseurs. And they seek out oils with that bitterness to it. The bitterness is an indication of freshness very often. So that if you have an oil that is very smooth and um, the chef's term that makes olive oil connoisseurs shudder is buttery. Ooh, that's a buttery oil, they say. And you think, oh my God, get it out of here because I don't want a buttery oil. I want that oil with penetrating, bitter, um, uh, sharp flavors to it that tell me that it's fresh olive oil. Um, and that's it's as important for chefs and, and food uh, people to understand that as it is for uh, for the public to understand it. It's a question of education more than anything else. And educating, again, educating the staff palate as well, because you don't want people going home from their jobs and saying to their wives or husbands, oh God, chef had us taste olive oil today. It was so greasy and horrible. You want them going home saying, chef had us taste the most amazing thing today. And that's education. You have traveled so widely, uh, especially in the Mediterranean. I wonder if you can 
come up with some examples of dishes, memorable dishes, where the olive oil really made the dish shine. Uh, it was just a great match between oil and, and the preparation. I've traveled throughout the Mediterranean a lot, and that, that's actually where I first got interested in olive oil. Obviously, it was in Italy when I was first there, and then uh, living in Spain, living in Lebanon, living in, in on the island of Cyprus, and traveling in Greece and North Africa and the south of France and all of that. I came to understand that it really is the fundamental ingredient in Mediterranean cuisine. That doesn't mean that you have to have a Mediterranean restaurant in order to have olive oil. It doesn't mean you have to have a a Greek restaurant in order to serve one of those great Greek, they call them lavera dishes, dishes that are in which olive oil is the basic ingredient of the dish. Very often those are vegetable dishes. And uh, and this goes back such a long way. You know, I'm going to say 3,000 years. It's longer ago than that. It's much longer. It probably goes back more like 6,000 years. Long before tomatoes ever arrived in the Mediterranean, olive oil was there and was fundamental. And Again, I I often mention this. I think it's an important point to make. When you're focusing on vegetables, you're focusing on ingredients that essentially don't have any fat in them. And there was a time 20 years or so ago when we were all going fat-free this and fat-free that, and it was a huge mistake because fat is really important in our diets for all sorts of reasons. It's important for brain health. It's important for stomach health, but it's also important because it makes it possible for us to metabolize a lot of the um, the elements, the anti uh, antioxidants and polyphenols that are present in vegetables, call them vitamins, if you will. Those don't metabolize well, unless, except in the presence of fat and the healthiest fat to have them uh, surrounded by is olive oil, of course. So you look to the Mediterranean for all of these traditional olive oil dishes. And I think of everything from, um, oh, the combinations of vegetables like uh, ratatouille or uh, caponata or pisto manchego in Spain. Um, You look at all the egg-based dishes like uh, frittata or even going a little farther east, the, um, what is it called? The sabzi uh, from, from Persia. That's basically, it's an omelet with lots and lots of herbs and olive oil in it. Or uh, a Spanish tortilla in which the potatoes and the olives are first almost reduced to a, not quite a pulp, that still have, have texture to them in masses of olive oil. Then they're drained and mixed with eggs and cooked in a little of that olive oil. It's a magnificent, I would say it's Spain's greatest gift to gastronomy. You know, people like to think of paella and all of that, but this tortilla española is just a magnificent dish. Or, you know, the other thing, thinking of Spain, of course, you think of this time of year of gazpacho, but then there's a whole range of cold soups that are just impossible to do without olive oil. Those um, yogurt-based cold soups from Turkey, for instance, or even going to Ukraine, a cold Ukrainian borscht in summertime, very refreshing and really important to have olive oil in there because what the olive oil does in addition to its health benefits, it also adds a kind of umami to vegetables that's often lacking. It it boosts the flavor. It... um, it in a in a funny sort of way it makes it go down more easily and I don't mean metabolize more easily I mean it just makes it a, a, a funner dish a better dish a more fun dish to eat so um, you know you you all you can't pick up a Mediterranean cookbook without finding dozens and dozens of of dishes with olive oil in them and a lot of them but then there's the, the whole range of meat and fish dishes of course in the Mediterranean that all rely on olive oil even. Even the famous Tuscan grilled beef steak, uh, that is grilled over usually a wood fire, not a charcoal fire, but a wood fire, and then dressed with extra virgin olive oil when it comes off the fire, not before. So all of these are ways of using olive oil in your cuisine. And again, it doesn't mean you have to have a Mediterranean kitchen. It doesn't mean you even have to advertise a dish on your menu as being from the Mediterranean. But you take that idea and you work with it and you make it your own, always keeping the essential elements of vegetables and olive oil, onions, garlic, 
parsley, a little basil, some tomatoes. You know, it's so funny. I, we always talk about what was the Mediterranean like before the tomato came in. I often ask myself, what was Mexican food like before they had olive oil to mix with their tomatoes? <laughs> um, Nancy, I think just maybe one more, if you have any further thoughts that you want to communicate to chefs or consumers about why they should take a deeper dive into olive oil, consider it more of a journey to explore the, the, all the, the vast range of flavors in olive oil. I think the journey towards using olive oil in the kind of exuberant way that Mediterranean chefs do is one that begins, you know, every journey begins with one step, right? And the first step is the first taste of olive oil. And I want to make sure that your first taste of olive oil as a chef or a cook, or, uh, you know, maybe you're a provider of uh, food in a uh, an institutional setting or something, but your first step should be a taste of what you know, what you are assured is a really fine olive oil. Because too many times people will go to the supermarket, take down a bottle of something labeled olive oil, take it home, taste it and say, ooh, I don't think I like this at all. I've had that happen to me over and over again with people who work for me. And so yeah. you want to go to somebody who is an authority, who knows what they're talking about, and you get that first taste and then you start to understand that olive oil comes in many many different flavors and it depends on a lot of things it depends on the variety that's used or the combination of varieties it depends on the freshness of the oil obviously as i've said it depends on where in the world it comes from because um i've had oils from i've had oils from south africa that i would not have known were not tuscan oils for instance i've had oils from chile that i can immediately immediately identify as Chilean oils because the taste is so, uh, I'm not going to say bland because that's an unfortunate world, but it's a very smooth, not buttery, but smooth flavor that Chilean oils have. And that's to be appreciated in many, many circumstances. So you you know, you, you want to experiment. You don't want to be afraid of cooking with it. The idea and this was expressed to me by one of the most famous chefs in California many, many years ago. You cannot cook with extra virgin olive oil. That is a complete and unfounded lie. And I, I like to say it's perpetrated by the, the people who are selling canola oil, most likely. But it is, uh, olive oil does not have a low burn point. It does not have a low flash point. It won't, it's not going to burst into flames on your stovetop if you heat it above 300 degrees. The International Olive Council says the smoke point for extra virgin is somewhere around 410 or 415 degrees. And the Bible of American cooks, even professional cooks, the joy of cooking, says that we should be deep fat frying at 350 to 360 degrees. Anything hotter than that, and you're going to burn the outside of the of the thing that you're frying before you cook the inside anything that lower than that and you're going to absorb too much fat and make the dish greasy and disgusting so olive oil the the smoke point for olive oil is way above the ideal cooking temperature and i encourage everybody to do exactly that, to get into the kitchen and cook with it. Because after all, that's what people in the Mediterranean have been doing for, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000 years. And that it's one of the healthiest populations in the world. So we should be following their example.